Okay, so yeah. hello everyone. Um, I'm Gabriella Richard. I'm from Penn State. And I'm taking a little bit of a different tack with my presentation. Uh, my presentation is critiquing the ways that youth, learners, and adults really think about media and how we can utilize technology in various ways. And I talk about multimodal, so I might use some jargon. Feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, to have them uh, reconstitute some of their preconceptions about their skills and abilities uh, to engage in, in STEM. So I focus a lot on computer science education and engineering education, but I come from this very interdisciplinary humanities focused approach. So a lot of what I do is around the maker movement. And if we think about the ways that the United States has really started to invest in making and certain forms of hobbyist computer science education, a lot of that came about around 2010 when then President Obama launched the first White House Science Fair, which later became the White House Maker Fair. As part of these activities, there was a push to increase investment, so this is the May 2013 report, in STEM education at all levels, K through 12. So we've seen a lot more federal initiatives. There's been a lot of NSF grants on STEM ed. They created some STEM ed foci in the Graduate Research Fellowship Program. They created a lot of opportunities for K through 12 education, a lot of um, research practice partnership grants. And a lot of that came out of this initiative that started at the White House. So it sort of propelled interest and investment in areas where we were already focusing in educational spaces, but maybe at the niches, right? So Scratch existed way before, who's familiar with Scratch? Okay, so some, some folks are. But Scratch existed before these investments and was part of a long line of research and practice coming out of MIT and other schools where they were developing block-based programming languages and programming languages that were more friendly to novices and youth, right? So Scratch was probably the first block-based program. But from there came investment in all of these other products. So Blockly being the Google derivative of Scratch, which then was part of efforts that became part of this whole computer science education, trying to broaden participation. So code.org was founded all around this time, 2013, and Hour of Code and Computer Science Education Week, which is in the middle of December, and trying to create these platforms that really encouraged youth to engage in coding online. And I don't know if you've ever played around with some of the various activities they have, but they're usually inspired by current anime or games of the time. So again, there were a lot of other initiatives that came out around this time, 2013, 2014, which was really about including underrepresented groups. So we had Girls Who Code, Black Girls Code, and the Hidden Genius Project, which is out of Oakland, really trying to encourage more diverse participation. Because we've known, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit more in my talk, that even though we've created all of these really openly accessible tools and platforms, we haven't really changed some of the persistent underrepresentation in technology and computer science, especially. So code.org, along with Medium, actually came out with a report very recently where they looked at diversity in computing jobs. Now, some of the worst diversity is in the game industry, which I, I study quite a bit. But in Silicon Valley, more generally, we still see persistent underrepresentation. And they projected that it would take about 100 years before we actually saw numbers that represented population numbers. So if you look at women make up the majority of the population in the United States, but yet they only make up around 24% of computing jobs, um, African Americans, so these statistics are not intersectional, so we don't know how many African American women, for example, um, are about 8.3% relative to their 12.6%, and Latinos kind of have the, the least representation. So if you look back at computing as a field, 
it's actually quite ironic because the first computers were women. How many people know that? Okay, so that's great. I'm glad that we finally know this. <laughs> Most of the time when I come out and I give this lecture to my students, they're all really surprised. Like, wow, I didn't know that. But So the first women, the first computer scientists were women. And they were actually first computers as well. And a lot of that happened because of wartime efforts. But even within, you know, up to the 60s and 70s, women were primarily a lot of the computer programmers and computer scientists. And of course, we've learned more recently about the black women who have, computed, who have contributed to computing as well. And their history has been a lot more um, you know, on the sidelines historically. But if we look here, the interesting trend is that women were almost at 50% around the 80s. And then there was a stark decline in their participation in computer science. And a lot of this, a lot of the research I do is on game culture and representation, and there's a direct correlation there because a lot of the earliest experiences that youth have with computing and computer science is through games. Um, and even in classrooms, a lot of those dynamics around who's capable with the computer is often um, distributed differently by teachers and, and certain assumptions about how they learn and what they're capable of engaging in. So there's been a lot of work around youth content creation and DIY and trying to encourage youth to learn by being computational producers. So not just consuming all of the media out there, but to create. And Scratch has been a real vehicle for this, as well as other platforms. But because you can learn how to code and you can create interactive media with Scratch, it's become um, kind of the, the center point for a lot of this research. So the idea is that you can engage in computational participation. You can uh, engage in really authentic knowledge creation and sharing with other people that are going to critique your knowledge and push you forward to really try to refine uh, what you've learned. And they do this through various means, but some of it is, I don't know if you've ever gone to Scratch, but it's kind of set up like YouTube where you, you publish your project and then a bunch of people can comment on your project and remix your project and learn from your code. So they can literally copy your project and see how you made it tick, right? So there's a lot of that that's built into Scratch itself. But a lot of the ideas that undergird Scratch come from a long line of research going all the way back to Lego and Logo. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Lego Mindstorms, which came out of Logo, which was more of the screen-based programming environment, a lot of syntax, a lot of line coding, but was coupled with um, a robotic element that allowed kids to visualize what commands they were sending through code. Now back then it was a little bit harder because of all of the syntax involved, but the idea was to have an embodied artifact that you could then see representing the code that you've programmed on the screen. And that's this turtle here, which later became the Lego. Yeah. Um. I don't, if anyone is interested in um, um, comic books, graphic novels, there's a comic um, called Secret Coders, and they use Logo, um, which is free online, and kids read this graphic novel and they actually learn coding in it. The author is Jean Yuan Yang. Mm -hmm. uh, look it up, Secret Coders, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And so all of this built up the foundation to Scratch later on. You know, the idea was to create an environment that would be a lot more appealing to kids a lot simpler, right, to have these blocks that were not only color coordinated to help reinforce and scaffold what their use was, but could then be easy to translate and understand when you were remixing somebody else's project or looking inside their project to see how they made it work. But the problem with all this promise was that we really focused on this idea that if we make it open source enough, if we make it novice friendly enough, then everyone's going to learn, right? That it's going to be accessible, it's gonna break down those barriers. But um, Michael Latchney and colleagues called this the content agnostic position, this idea that if you just create something and it's open source, 
and it's available that everyone's going to use it equally. But we know that that's not the case. So the problem is that a lot of what gets produced on Scratch is what they see and engage in every day. So they're recreating video games that they really like, and they're recreating the various media that they consume that has its own problems around representation as well. And we did um, a study, myself and Yasmin Kafai, where we looked at not only what sorts of projects were being created on Scratch, but how many people were disclosing their gender and racial background on Scratch? And what were the comments like in these culturally diverse projects? And what we found was a little bit disheartening. We did more of a case study approach, but not very many people were disclosing their race or gender. And when they did, it wasn't always, it wasn't always, um, I guess I would say, uh, well supported. So it was this idea that, especially with underrepresented groups, oh wow, I didn't realize that there were other African Americans on this site, was one thing that a young woman said. And she kind of was not fully embraced by the other person that she identified as African American. It was as if that's not really something to embrace or celebrate. And along with the contents and the, and the projects, we also found that when some projects dealt with difficult issues around race, and culture, they weren't always perceived very well. And some of that was just this lack of understanding of how to engage with really difficult subject matter. But some of that is related to a lot of these persistent issues that we have in culture around who's supported in the classroom, what schools have, what kinds of programs and opportunities available to them. Uh, in some recent reports out of Georgia Tech, for example, we see that some states don't have any girls who ever take this computer science exam or any people of color who take the computer science exam. And, and the states that actually did have that representation, often it was only one or two teachers that was really invested in making sure that there was representation um, of girls and African Americans and Hispanics taking the exam. So one of the projects that I've engaged in is sort of hacking implicit biases, right? So this idea that if we think about some of the baggage and some of the assumptions that comes with all of these different tools and technologies that we use, how about we combine them in an interesting way and get people to have to work together? So this was related to a lot of different efforts and um, things that I've been interested in around computer science education and engineering education, but it was also related to what I was seeing around who was interested, who would more readily sign up for different opportunities. So when it came to electronic textiles, we found an overwhelming amount of girls and young women that would sign up. When it came to coding and Scratch, sometimes with Scratch it was about design, so you would see some equal representation, but it really depended if you overemphasize coding, then you would see more boys. So I thought about, well, what if we get people to think about all of these things and what they can create together? So this is a curriculum that combines all of these different tools and technologies. They have to learn all the various tools and technologies. It's project-based. They create a lot of projects together in small groups, usually two people working together. And then at the end, they have to create this embodied project that's both physical and digital. So that means that each of them takes on a different role, and some of them work with creating the digital-based representation on Scratch, which involves some coding. Some, some members will just do the coding, and others will design the sprites. And others will work with the Lilypad Arduino, which is like the Arduino, to create physically embodied kinds of interaction. And others will work with the materials. So what kinds of materials are we going to have them interact with um, when they're uh, creating these projects? So some people were really into uh, thinking about the different material affordances. You know, do I use conductive thread, or will I use a sticker or conductive paint and ink? And some of this was related to what I talked about before. Utilizing e-textiles was, was 
a nice bridge for bringing more women into these informal computer science opportunities, but also there have been a lot of examples that have been really culturally relevant as well. So um, Yasmin Kafai and um, Kristen Searle have done quite a bit of work with Native American communities and some of the ways that they've bridged thinking about um, learning math and computation by creating textiles with e-textiles. So these were the different platforms that I used. Um, there's Scratch, there's the Makey Makey, which is kind of a plug and play ready physical computing kit. How many of you are familiar with the Makey Makey? Well, this is basically how it works. You, know, you can make anything with some conductivity into um, a, a controller for the computer. So it replaces the keys, hence Makey Makey. Um, oh, <laughs> the lily pad Arduino is the sewable microcontroller. So it, it uses conductive thread instead of wires, right? But they're unshielded, so there's, there's a little bit of um, having to think about how you design your circuits and lay them out ahead of time so that you don't cross wires. Uh, ModKit, it's, it doesn't really exist anymore. We're using mBlock now, so if anyone's interested in the tools, I can talk about that later. But it was an MIT graduate student project which was a block-based version to code microcontrollers. And we wanted to think about the affordability match between Scratch and a similar kind of programming environment for the lily pads. So we used ModKit. The great thing about ModKit is that it also displayed what it would look like if you designed it in the Arduino IDE or programmed it in the Arduino IDE. So it was a nice bridge to get people to understand the syntax involved. And so they would combine all of these together and create a bi-directionally responsive artifact. So they were combining art and technology in a really unique way. And then they would also, before they actually got to that part, they would engage in you know, this ideation, exercise, design thinking, and come up with designs that would complement each other's designs. It's part of the final project they had to work together. <laughs> that was one of the stipulations. And they tended to find groups that were complementary in skills and interest. So I'm going to show you an example of one of the um, final projects that, that was created by a group. Yeah, why don't you explain how you design? Well, so basically we wanted like, at first we thought uh, the game, and then we wanted like a physical. So first we were going to do a watch, and then we, we, needed, we needed a bigger thing than a watch to fit the LED and the tripod. So we thought of doing like a, like a little like flower thing in the middle. So we cut it out and then he flips his own head on. And there's like a little thing that attaches to your fingers. So that we could attach this end and we could sew it without intersecting the conductive fabric. So right, right. like, yeah, it would be like really smooth. So we just did that. And then we, connect, we sewed these on and then we sewed on the little We sewed those on because it's like yeah, sticker. Sticker. And then we just connected it. We coded it and then it worked. So we just connected it to the making making and we, we already had our game. So we just plugged it. Great job, Great. And it's changing different colors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like red, 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 um, and that related to the different states in the game. They created this pet care game. So they had a, a dinosaur that would respond and do different things. It would eat an apple or jump on a trampoline. So what we found researching this project was that overall, most teams exhibited very inclusive practices when it came to coming up with their team design. People tended to cross over from what they thought they would be good in. So if they thought they were really good programmers, they would then transition to being the crafters on the team, which was really interesting. So it was a way to get them to move beyond what they thought was valuable to what was valuable to the product. So we found a lot more boys 
taking on the role of crafting and sewing. Because in a, in a sense, it was like, well, I'm doing computer science. And of course, that has some problems there too to frame that in terms of computer science and technology. But it did break down some of those barriers. And, and that's the interesting thing we continue to see is that boys tend to take on more of that role that role of working with the lily pad Arduino and doing the sewing. Um, so that's the changing the ways that the gendered interests are expressed. The tools themselves served as a scaffold for collaboration because they had this final project that they had to create together. So they often sought out other students that they may not have known beforehand. So there, there are often groups that come in together. They know each other. but. If they needed someone who was really good at sewing on their team, then they had to switch roles. So we often found that there were new friendships that forged through this program. Not always, but most of the time. Um, so overall, there are different ways to address inclusivity. I call this more the implicit way of addressing inclusivity. We know some of the ways that we can explicitly address inclusivity, and I'll talk about that in a second when we get to questions. Um, but we need to think about the ways that kids are engaging not only with the media, but how they can have opportunities to critically redesign their media in, in a variety of multimodal ways, not just screen-based ways because media is becoming a lot more pervasive. So these are some questions that I don't have all of the answers to, but I thought that they might provoke some discussion later on. So how do we design for and scaffold inclusion? So a lot of what we've done thus far in the field is we've included diverse representation in advertising materials. We know that that works. We know that including diverse role models and mentors works um, and allowing for learning opportunities and so not just assuming that people know how to do these things when they come in, but to encourage not only opportunities to learn at hackathons or maker fairs, but also allow for mixed expert teams so people can learn together and encouraging learners to critique commercialized products and recreate with culturally meaningful or civically minded projects. But how can we scale these features? So we talk a lot about this content agnostic position, but how do we have more culturally situated positions that are informed in some of our greater media? I don't think we've solved that problem, nor do we quite have the answer yet. And how can we have the sustainable impact on the tech industry? Because the tech industry still has those persistent problems, but maybe part of it is that we still continue to hold certain role models as the heads of tech. So maybe there needs to be different role models different tech industries that emerge. All right, well, thank you so much. I know I took more than enough time, but. <laughs>